Welcome to this talk on triage. Now, in an ideal world, every patient would receive the nursing and medical assessment they need immediately, which would then directly be followed by the most appropriate, prioritised, individualised treatments. However, in practice, we have to work through healthcare systems and several patients, indeed numerous patients, can all report at the same time requiring treatment. It therefore becomes necessary for us to discriminate between rival patient needs, meaning we have to make an assessment of the degree of urgency required in the management of a particular wound, traumatised person or illness. And this allows us to decide the order in which we need to manage a group or possible large number of patients, whether presenting with trauma or medical problems. We therefore need a process whereby a patient receives a rapid examination and those with the greatest need receive the most intensive care first, while those with less serious problems can afford to wait for a period of time. So we need a systemised, consistent approach to our prioritisation of care. And this is what triage is all about. Now, the idea of triage was first used by the French in the Napoleonic Wars, but was greatly developed by military medical personnel by the French in the First World War. And triage is actually a noun. It means to sort or to classify. And trier would be the verb, the doing word. So the process of trier goes on in the triage. That's the derivation of the term. So it means to sort or to classify. And this is exactly what we are doing in triage. We're sorting and classifying. And we can see this photograph on the left is a French triage station. We can tell that because of the French uniform worn by the medic in the background. Now, in the First World War, the French just classified very simply into three categories. Firstly, there were those patients that were likely to live regardless of the care that they received. So they weren't urgent because they're likely to live anyway. And then, of course, with it being war, there was lots of overwhelming injuries. So there was those patients that were unlikely to live regardless of the care that they received. But then there was a the third group of patients for whom immediate care could improve the outcome, where medical care could improve the probability that the patient would greatly improve and make a recovery, or as well as they could recover given the wounds they had sustained. So it was this last category of those that would benefit from help that triage was really designed to sort and classify. And since then, the idea has become more prevalent. It was used in the Second World War. But in the early 90s, the Manchester Triage Group tried to bring about consensus and consistency in this approach. And now this thinking is used nationally and internationally to give us consistency in the way we sort and classify people reporting for our care, whether it is a medical cause, a traumatic cause or a surgical cause of their problem. Now, it's hard to say that an approach is ever optimised, but we do have approaches which we believe are the best we can do at the moment. That's not to say they won't be evolutional, incremental improvements in the future, but there's something that we have now that we believe works. And there's two important aspects here is if we've optimised a particular approach, it's good that everyone uses this optimised approach. So everyone is using the best approach that we have at the moment. And the other advantage of everyone using the same approach is that we understand each other. There is consistency nationally and internationally. So we want a common nomenclature, the way that we describe things. We want common de definition of terms. We want a robust methodology. We want a way that we can do things that we know works pragmatically and we believe is optimised for the time being. We need to diffuse these ideas via training packages 
And then we need to evaluate the effectiveness of our intervention with an audit guide. So these are all useful, in fact, very important, you could argue essential components of approaches to any particular system. And certainly with our approach to the triage systems that we're using. Well, the Manchester Triage Group decided on the following nomenclature, the meaning of these words. So category one patients require immediate assessment and treatment by a clinician. Otherwise, there could be devastating consequences for the individual in terms of catastrophic injury, injuries getting worse or indeed life threatening situations. And we also get a number. So category one require immediate care and the zero minutes allowed before they get treated. Category two are described as being very urgent and that means they can wait for a maximum of 10 minutes before they're seen by a clinician and properly treated. Category three is urgent, but they can wait for up to 60 minutes. Category four is standard, a standard presentation. They can wait for two hours, 120 minutes. And category five is described as non-urgent. They can wait for 240 minutes. Now, the number of minutes that people can wait, these were times that were agreed for the UK. In other situations, it could be more, it could be less. Obviously, the lower the number of minutes, the better. These are maximum figures. We don't want to go beyond these. And importantly, we have the colours. So red is category one for zero minutes. Orange is very urgent. Yellow is urgent. Green is standard and blue is non-urgent. So every patient under this system is awarded a number and a colour. And that implies a number of minutes until they're treated by a clinician. But of course, if we can treat them quicker than this, then that's better. So every patient presented should be awarded, or not awarded, should be allocated a colour and a number that describes how urgent it is that they are assessed and treated by a clinician after presentation. Now, very often it takes time to arrive at a diagnosis. We need to examine the patient in some detail. So the aim of the triage encounter, which can be very brief, is not really to make a diagnosis, but to allocate a clinical priority. Are they going to be in category one, two, three, four, or five? Are they going to be red, orange, yellow, green, or blue? Because we need to seek the higher priorities first. So if we go through some discriminators and we don't have any of these, what we might call red flag clinical features, clinical features that are going to put a patient in a higher priority, then very often they end up in the green category by default. So we need to recognize signs and symptoms that discriminate between clinical priorities. A sign is something we see, a symptom is something the patient reports to us. What are the signs and symptoms that are going to allocate the patient to a particular priority group? One, two, three, four or five. And these signs and symptoms are called discriminators. They allow us to discriminate between patients for group allocation. Now, it's useful to think about general discriminators and specific discriminators. So general discriminators are going to apply to all patients at all times. So severe pain is going to be a general discriminator. Specific discriminators relate to key features of a particular condition. So for example, a pleuritic pain would be related to pain in the, from the pleural membranes, perhaps caused by a pleuritic infection such as pleurisy or perhaps symptomatic of a lobe pneumonia or as a result of penetrating chest injury, but it's specific to a subset of conditions. So general ones apply to all patients at all times. Specific discriminators are specific conditions. Now the following are considered to be general discriminators. Anytime there's a threat to life, consciousness level, hemorrhage, temperature, pain and acuteness 
These are general discriminators that will apply to all patients with all conditions. So, if there's compromise of the airway, breathing or the circulation, there's a threat to life, these patients are given a red priority. So life threat is a general discriminator. Another one is consciousness level. Is the patient currently fitting? Do they have an altered level of consciousness? Or do they have a history of altered level of consciousness? And again, this is going to influence the priority. Currently fitting is going to be a very high priority. An altered level of consciousness might be a slightly lower priority. A history of altered level of consciousness might be lower still, but not necessarily. For example, you might think of patients who might develop a extradural hematoma, the patients that we say can talk and die. We might want to allocate them to a much higher category. Hemorrhage is a general discriminator. Is the hemorrhage exsanguinating? Is all the blood just coming out of the patient's body? Are they bleeding out? Are they exsanguinating? Or is the hemorrhage major? Or is it minor? And again, this is going to influence the prioritisation category the patient is allocated to. What about the patient's temperature? If the skin feels very hot, the temperature could be high, 41 degrees centigrade or higher. That's clearly an emergency situation. If the patient feels hot, the temperature is probably 38.5 or higher. It's uh, rele relevant, but maybe not as urgent as a patient that is very hot. Or if the patient just feels warm to the touch, then the temperature is probably less than 38.5 degrees centigrade, and that is a lower priority. What about the level of pain? Severe pain is a high priority. Moderate pain is a lower priority. Or is there a history of pain? can be clinically very significant, but it will put the patient in a lower prioritisation bracket. And what about acuteness? Acute means of recent onset, the converse is chronic, which means that the condition started a while ago. So abrupt means the onset is within seconds and minutes. That could merit a high priority. Acute is within the last 24 hours. The features have developed within the last 24 hours. Or recent means that the features have developed in the last seven days and that may attract a lower level of prioritisation. So these are general discriminators applying to all patients as the life threats, consciousness level, haemorrhage, temperature, pain and acuteness. These help us to discriminate between all groupings of patients. Now here we have our general discriminators that relate to the life threatening situation and these ones deal with airway and breathing so non patent airway patent means that the air can flow through easily in and out of the airway if the airway is obstructed then a is compromised it's going to be our first priority if the patient doesn't have a patent airway so non patent airway stridor means noisy breathing through a partial obstruction in the upper airway. So stridor can be inspiratory, that there's a noise when the person breathes in, or expiratory, there's a noise when the person breathes out, or indeed both, but it indicates partial obstruction of the airway, which means that there's a potential for complete obstruction of the airway. So stridor is included under life threats as a red category one priority situation. Now, if the patient is apneic, if they're not breathing, then clearly that's also a life threatening situation. That's on to B now, this is related to breathing. And to declare that the breathing is absent, that the patient is apneic, we should look, listen and feel. So we put our ear down near the patient's nose so we can feel the air going in and out onto our ear. If indeed there is any air going in and out, we can hear the air going in and out. And at the same time, we can look down on the patient's chest and abdomen to see if there's any ventilatory respiratory effort. And if it's absent for 10 seconds, we can classify that patient as apneic and they go into red category one. And also if there's an increased breathing workload. If ventilation is taking a lot of effort, 
as might be the case in a severe asthmatic attack when the patient has is having to employ all of the uh, accessory muscles of ventilation. It was very hard work for the patient to breathe. That indicates there's some significant underlying injury or pathology, but it also indicates that the patient is at risk of exhaustion. So they are the A and B general discriminators. Now still thinking about red category one general discriminators that indicate that immediate treatment is required, we move on to C for circulation. Now if there's no pulse that indicates we may well be in a cardiac arrest situation. And to determine this we need to palpate a central artery or we need to palpate the anatomical position of a central pulse for five seconds before saying there is no pulse. Because if we palpate it for less than that it might just be that the patient is bradycardic and we miss it because the pulse rate is slow. And also when we're palpating central pulses, we must put our fingers in precisely the right anatomical position. Now, if someone's got a central pulse and you put your fingers on a position which is not quite on the pulse, but just to the side of it, then you can feel around and then you can say, oh yes, there's the pulse there because you can feel it. But if there's no pulse, then you must be certain that you're putting your fingers on exactly the right position. Otherwise you can't declare that there's no pulse there. So we have to practice palpating femoral and carotid pulses to develop this skill. But if there's no pulse over a central artery for five seconds, then we can say that that patient has no pulse. Now shock is also a red level one discriminator, again meaning the patient needs immediate treatment. But it can be sometimes difficult to recognise shock. So we think about pallor, the paleness. This is caused by sympathetically induced compensatory peripheral vasoconstriction, particularly at the level of the arterioles. It can be harder to tell with people with darker coloured skin. So look particularly at the mucous membranes and the lips. But pallor is the paleness. And the coldness, the skin often feels cold, and particularly there can be cold extremities because of the peripheral vasoconstriction, meaning that warm blood is not going to the hands and feet. Sweating is also caused by sympathetic compensation. Tachycardia is an attempt to increase cardiac output via the mechanism of increasing heart rate. And reduced consciousness level can indicate that the blood pressure is so low that the brain is not being adequately perfused. In other words, that there is a hypotension induced cerebral hypoperfusion. Again, a very serious clinical indicator, meaning that the patient needs immediate treatment. The third general discriminator under C is probably fairly obvious, exsanguinating hemorrhage, where the blood is draining out of the body and this will cause death. Now do remember blood can be lost onto the floor and four more. So as well as the external hemorrhage onto the floor, blood can be lost into the thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity, the pelvic cavity, or into the limbs associated with long bone fractures. So look for the clinical indicators of exsanguinating hemorrhage, as well as looking for the blood itself. If they're present, the patient is a category one red classification requiring immediate life saving treatment because they're in this life threatening situation. Now there are also level one discriminators, general discriminators based on altered level of consciousness. So if an adult or a child is currently fitting then that becomes a category one, they require immediate management. The big risk here is that the patient is going to have an obstructed airway. So fitting is associated with an increased risk of obstructed airway. So our main role is to maintain the patient's airway and also to make sure they come to no harm during the fit and are put into an appropriate recovery position when appropriate.
And the other one related to altered level of consciousness that's different in children compared to adults. Now, if we have a AVPU, alert, responding to voice, responding to pain, unresponsive classification. If a child is unresponsive, then that classifies as a red level one situation. We might not know what's causing the unresponsiveness in the child, but it does mean that that child is very poorly and requires immediate assessment and management. Now, still with our general discriminators, we're now thinking about very urgent level two, and orange is the very urgent category. So altered level of consciousness is in this category. Now, it doesn't matter what's caused the altered level of consciousness. If a patient has an altered level of consciousness, they're at risk of airway compromise. For example, they could have their head in a down position and the airway could be closed. Or there could be vomit, which obstructs the airway, resulting in aspiration. So the cause of the level of consciousness is not the important thing. It's the potential complications of the altered level of consciousness that is the problem. So if a patient is unconscious, they're at risk of many things. We've mentioned airway, but they're also at risk of injuring themselves through lying in an inappropriate position. And this is the same whether it's an adult or a child. So reduced level of consciousness goes into the very urgent category because we can prevent these complications of unconsciousness. Well, again, the guidelines are somewhat different between children and adults. So children should be alert. If a child is only responding to voice or pain, then they go into the orange, very urgent category because it indicates some underlying condition, which requires very urgent assessment and management. So this is based on the alert, voice, pain, unresponsive, AVPU scale of measuring level of consciousness and reduced level of consciousness. Now the guidelines put uncontrolled major hemorrhage into the very urgent category. But remember, the very urgent category technically can wait up to 10 minutes. And this isn't true if a patient has uncontrolled major hemorrhage because in 10 minutes they could completely exsanguinate. So this shows that we have to apply these guidelines with a lot of clinical common sense. So if someone has an uncontrolled major hemorrhage at risk of exsanguination, we'd want to treat that certainly much, much quicker than in the first 10 minutes. But this is what the guidelines say, but it just shows we have to interpret them using our clinical acumen. Now, thinking about the alterations in body temperature, here we have some general discriminators that would indicate the person goes into the very urgent orange category. And one is a very hot person over a year. So this is a very hot child or a very hot adult. Very hot indicates their temperature might be 41 degrees C or more. That's very urgent. And also a cold person. If a person feels cold, their temperature may well be less than 35 degrees centigrade. They may be hypothermic. Again, a very urgent classification. But a baby only has to be hot to get into the very urgent category. So a hot baby, a baby being classified as a person between zero and one year of age. Because if they're hot, that can indicate their temperature is 38.5 degrees centigrade or above. Now, this can be associated with complications, but the main problem with hot babies is that they can become very hot very quickly. And that can result in brain damage because you can get coagulation of the proteins in the, in the brain tissue resulting in irreversible brain damage potentially. So a baby only has to be hot, temperature above 38.5, to get into the very urgent classification of orange. Now, the final general discriminator indicating someone should go into the very urgent category is severe pain. After trauma in disease processes, patients will often describe pain as unbearable, the worst pain ever. The patient might have myocardial pain, they might have renal colic, biliary colic. They might have pain from trauma or a broken bone. 
these patients can be in, in unbearable pain. So do give these patients intravenous morphine or whatever they need. Intravenous paracetamol is also a very good analgesic. And bear in mind we can mix opioids, paracetamol and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory group of drugs. So we're now thinking about yellow general discriminators. But yellow still means urgent. So we're not talking about trivial discriminators. These are still very important clinical signs and symptoms. So a patient presenting with a history of unconsciousness, whether an adult or a child. So if there's a history of recent unconsciousness, that is still an urgent situation. So for example, you might think about a history of unconsciousness after head injury, associated with an increased risk of extradural hematoma, which of course is a life-threatening situation. Uncontrolled minor hemorrhage is a discriminator for the urgent category. Yellow level three. But of course, it depends how we define minor. We have to use our clinical judgment here. We must not follow these guidelines in a blind way. We still have to use our clinical discrimination, clinical assessment skills and clinical acumen to decide how urgent a treatment is. Now a hot person who is more than one year of age has probably got a temperature of 38.5 degrees centigrade or greater. They go in the yellow urgent category. Remember that if a baby is hot with a temperature of 38.5 degrees centigrade or above, they will go into category two orange. So if someone's hot, they're pyrexial, indicating there's probably some sort of infectious process going on, viral or bacterial infection. Or it could be the result of trauma or other pathological process. And bear in mind that if someone's had paracetamol or aspirin or ibuprofen, they're going to be antipyretic. They can bring the temperature down. So we can get false low readings if someone's just taken a gram of paracetamol an hour before they've been admitted to our care. Moderate pain goes into the urgent category. This is the sort of pain that might be treated reasonably effectively with uh, oral analgesics. We can give paracetamol. We can give paracetamol and ibuprofen. We could give paracetamol, ibuprofen and codeine because these are in the different categories of analgesics. Or we could give paracetamol and codeine. What we wouldn't do is give two preparations containing paracetamol or two preparations containing um, ibuprofen or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And we wouldn't normally give more than 60 milligrams of codeine. Moving on now to green discriminators that indicate someone is a category four green. Green is standard, blue is non-urgent. So a warm person probably has a temperature between 37 and 38.5 degrees centigrade. They could well be pyrexial, but if the temperature is less than 38.5, they can go into the standard category. They still need assessed and managed, but in a standard category. Same for recent mild pain, they can go into standard. And recent problems, particularly if it's greater than seven days, can be green or blue, depending on our assessment of how severe the recent problem is. Well, here we see the overall flow diagram for general discriminators that allow us to allocate red, orange, yellow, green or blue categories. But this is a little bit small, the writing here, so let's look at them one at a time. Well, we have already looked at these in this presentation, but let's just notice airway compromise, inadequate breathing, exsanguinating hemorrhage, shock, unresponsive child or currently fitting will go into the red category. The airway compromise, inadequate breathing, exsanguinating hemorrhage and shock would come under the ABC. The unresponsive child or currently fitting would come under the altered level of consciousness criteria. Now here we see the very urgent orange level two general discriminators. <clears throat> 
and we notice that uncontrollable major haemorrhage, new abnormal pulse are both related to A, B and C. Then altered level of consciousness is clearly related to that category. Very hot, hot baby and cold all come under the altered body temperature classification and pain comes under the pain classification in this case, severe pain, which is very urgent. Now here we see the general discriminators for the yellow urgent category. Uncontrolled minor haemorrhage. Now these guidelines actually say uncontrollable, but we think we can control it. So it is a currently uncontrolled minor haemorrhage. But again, it depends how minor you've got to use your discretion. That would come under the ABC. History of unconsciousness would be the altered level of consciousness. Warm baby or hot person would be under the altered body temperature and moderate pain would be under the pain classification. Now green is standard and blue is non-urgent. So if the patient is warm, recent mild pain or recent problem, we would classify those as green or blue, depending on what our clinical acumen suggested was most appropriate. Now what we've looked at here are general discriminators, but there's also going to be specific discriminators depending on the patient's presentation. And patients can present with many different problems. So here, for example, is a list of A and B presentations, simply presentations beginning with A and presentations beginning with B. And each of these will have subsets of their own specific discriminators that are going to allocate patients with these presentations into a particular category. Now here we have presentations that begin with C and D. And again, these are going to have their own specific discriminators that are going to decide whether patients with these presentations are allocated into the immediate red, very urgent orange, urgent yellow, standard green, or non-urgent blue categories of prioritization. As we've said, for each of the presentations, there's going to be specific discriminators. And the Manchester Triage Group do cover a complete list of general discriminators. Here's the start of the list, abdominal pain, abrupt onset, acute chemical eye injury, and it goes on down through the alphabet. So we see that as well as the general discriminators we've talked about, there's going to be specific discriminators for the likely presentations into an A&E department or into our care. And that is the future topic that we can look at. But for now, we're going to close this video because we've introduced the concept of triage introduce the idea of prioritization and looked at the general discriminators. So the next thing to do is look at all the specific material relating to specific presentations and the more specific discriminators required for those presentations to be correctly sorted and correctly classified for them to be correctly triaged.